New ideas happen all the time, but good new ideas are hard to come by. Research and development of a new way of doing things can be expensive and time consuming. Plus, if someone could just steal your idea afterwards, they would get all the benefit and none of the pain. That's why patents exist, as a way to protect ideas and to encourage people to develop new ideas and designs. But patents are just a tool and can be used well and poorly. Gaming patents are no different. Some protect ingenious designs in their infancy, some protect not as ingenious designs but are still aggressively guarded by their patent holder, and some protect ideas that never even got off the ground, trapped as a diagram on paper forever. Patents can be useful, but they aren't magic. They can be worked around, fought over, used, and misused. I've got some interesting gaming patents to talk about, so let's see how they worked for companies and were worked around by their competitors. First, some really simplified groundwork on what a patent is. Other videos go into more detail about the patent process, all the different kinds of patents, and how they can help and harm creativity. But we're not lawyers, so, you know, don't rely on us. Warning, design doc is not a replacement for a real law education. Patent idea quality may vary. Please consult the most expensive legal team you can find. A patent gives its owner the sole right to make, sell, or use the patented idea for some period of time, usually 20 years. Think of getting a patent as like gaining an exclusive license on an idea, and that license allows you to sue anyone who copies it. In a perfect world, a patent is supposed to prevent someone from immediately ripping off your good ideas. But which ideas are patentable is subject to interpretation. Even ideas that seem obvious or silly can be patented under the right circumstances. There are tons of gaming patents that boil down to something kind of obvious. Maybe the most famous example is in Crazy Taxi. Sega patented a few of Crazy Taxi's core gameplay ideas. Starting in 1998, a patent titled Game Display Method, Moving Direction Indicating Method, Game Apparatus, and Drive Simulating Apparatus, yes, most of these patents have terrible names, meant that no one besides Sega could use a floating arrow like this that points to your destination. The same patent also covered exactly how the Crazy Taxi pedestrians would jump out of the way of your car. A short time later, Radical Entertainment developed The Simpsons Road Rage, licensed from Fox. It's, let's say, conspicuously similar. That hand looks pretty familiar. Hmm. That car dodging looks pretty familiar. Hmm. So, Sega sued Fox for infringing on their patent. Fox and Sega settled out of court, quietly, for an undisclosed amount of money. No one, or at least no one worth suing, tested Sega's patent again. But developers are creative. Limits, like the limit being enforced by Sega's legal department, can lead to creativity. Patents don't cover every possible way to solve the same design problem, just a specific implementation. It was time for a workaround. An arrow isn't the only HUD element you can use to convey direction. Fable's developers use a glowing breadcrumb trail. Skyrim has a compass heading and waypoint markers to help point you in the right direction. You start seeing a lot of minimap-based navigation crop up right after Crazy Taxi 2. Grand Theft Auto 3 and onwards all use the minimap heavily instead of floating arrows for mission directional guidance. Fox even jumped back in after their arrow lawsuit. The Simpsons Hidden Run didn't need any arrows. They added a minimap. Just like, oh, GTA doesn't have a patent on that minimap, huh? Hope you cleared it with legal this time. The minimap is a much better design than an arrow anyway. It's way more flexible and lets you plan routes and see multiple objectives at once. You can't see a secondary objective with just one arrow. So even though Sega's patent on Crazy Taxi's arrow kept others from using it, it still did the gaming world a small service. It forced other companies to think harder, lest they get sued like Fox did. And the new design solved even more problems. The Crazy Taxi patent expired in late 2018, so anyone can now put that arrow in their game. Eh, the world has moved on. I don't think it'll be coming back. Not every patent protects a flimsy design, though. Lots of them protect popular, well-loved pieces of video game history. There may be nothing that evokes video games as a medium more than the D-pad. But until 2005, Nintendo owned a patent that protected maybe the most well-known version of it. Nintendo's patent, mercifully titled just Multi-Directional Switch, covered the design and mechanics of Nintendo's D-pad. It specified how the top was a single piece of plastic, with four directional arrows showing on top, pivoting around the center nub, and it could tilt in four directions. It covered how a button press pushed down on a piece of rubber with these little conductive pads. The pads touched a circuit board with electrodes on top, completed a circuit, and that signaled to the console that you pressed a button. 
The patent also covered how the pads and the top plastic bounced back to a neutral position when you let go. The patent was granted in 1987, and the whole D-pad assembly became a staple of Nintendo's controllers ever since. The NES, SNES, Game Boy, GBA, N64, GameCube, DS Lite, Wii, Wii U, and the Switch Pro controller all used extremely similar D-pad hardware. Only the DS, 3DS, and the Switch's Joy-Con didn't use the same design. The DS and 3DS used metal dome switches, and Nintendo's traditional D-pad just could not work with the Switch's single Joy-Con controller configuration. It was replaced with four independent buttons that could just be remapped as a D-pad. Nintendo held the rights to this D-pad, but Nintendo had competitors. They each had to do something similar to it. The D-pad is just too useful of a design to omit from Sega, Sony, and Microsoft's consoles. They all had to find a way around this protected design. Sega didn't change much. The Genesis and the Game Gear just redesigned the top plastic key. Instead of a four-way pad, they each had a circular, multi-directional key. The internal rubber pad and circuit board were kept very similar to Nintendo's design. It's just different enough to avoid a patent lawsuit. The Saturn had a different unique plastic key, going with a domed multi-way design, but again it kept very similar internals. The Dreamcast D-pad looks like Nintendo's at first glance. There are no arrows on top about which direction is which, but by 1999 that was pretty safe to leave out. The changes were mostly on the inside. Inside the Dreamcast controller, the D-pad doesn't use the same pivot mechanism. Well, actually it does, but the pivot point is on the internal rubber bit instead of the top plastic key. That's it. Even though they look the same and do similar things in a similar way, just that one teeny tiny change makes the designs different enough for Sega to use no problem. Sony took a cue from the Genesis and just drastically changed the look of the top key for the PlayStation controller. Inside it still relies on the pivot and contact mechanism that Nintendo's design does, they did add a sheet of conductive plastic to the DualShock 2 and 3, which let the controller detect how hard players were pressing on each button. It was meant mostly for the face buttons, like how it was used for Metal Gear Solid, but the functionality was very simple. It was easy to give the D-pad the same functionality. Microsoft changed the plastic key for both the Xbox and Xbox 360. For the Notorious Duke controller, Microsoft put this wavy, melted Pringle looking thing on the top. and. What? Wait a minute. They redesigned the interior. Gone is the single molded rubber pad. Please welcome a few separate tiny rubber pads. The contact points and central pivot look like they're attached directly to the plastic, and they flex down to make contact with the circuit board. And, oh wait, that's just a plastic piece hiding the single molded rubber pad. Okay, yeah, it's just like all the other D-pads, but like twice as complicated. The controller S and the 360 controller put a Sega-esque circular key on top, changed the underside design to make the pad feel just terrible, and used everyone's favorite rubber contact pad assembly. A redesigned transforming D-pad showed up in a special 360 controller released years later, and while it was a little better, it still didn't feel that great. The Xbox One was released in 2013, after Nintendo's patent had expired, and hey look at that. Wonder where that design came from. Boy, that looks like it's gonna be Nintendo's design. WRONG! Look at that. A metal spring mechanism on the interior. And metal dome switches. And no rubber to be found. And the Elite controller has magnets in it. Someone finally used a new D-pad mechanism. Right when they stopped having to dance around the patent. Go figure. As we go over these designs, you might ask yourself, if competitors can just make tiny tweaks to your design and sell that, why bother with the patent at all? But you can also think of the patent as a way to protect the external look of a company's products too. Even little decorative things like the look of the top plastic key can work as a kind of branding. If you see Sony's D-pad, you think PlayStation, and that brand association does have some value worth protecting. Man, that was five minutes on D-pad design? So let's close it out with some rapid fire patents. Namco patented putting games in the loading screen, it's expired now. Game up your loading screens. Or hide them behind shimming between rocks and stuff. Everyone's doing it. Namco also patented the really good tutorial and practice mode in Tekken, which showed you the button inputs for combos as you pressed them. Thanks, Namco. Steal it anyway. It expired in 2017. Square filed a patent for Final Fantasy X's Sphere Grid, 
and made it 10 times harder to understand in this description. Okay, got it. Don't steal this one though, it's still active in 2019. Oh, and remember Final Fantasy Tactics Advance? That judge system with the red and yellow cards? Panted. That mechanic was neat. Gotta wait until 2025 for this one to expire. The Bioware Dialogue Wheel? Patented. Katamari Damacy? Sticking things to a ball in a video game is now patented. Thanks again, Namco! There's a Sony patent for skipping ads by yelling at your TV. In the year 2000, Koei patented something that kinda sorta seems like how Dynasty Warriors does group battles. They did write this line in there though. With the rapid advance of current computer technology, it is possible to display images on the screen of the TV monitor that are equal to that of movies. Sure buddy. Year 2000. Just as good as movies. I think I'll cut it off here. There are literally thousands of gaming patents, and more are approved all the time. Whether any one patent was worth getting is debatable, but each and every one is valuable in another way. Every patent shows the mindset of the company that pursued it. Each is an artifact of an idea that someone wanted to protect. Even though it costs a ton of time and money, even if the idea could still be tweaked and used, even if the idea never got off the ground. Patents may be a flawed tool, but each one is born from a desire to design something that stands the test of time. If you're looking to design something worth patenting, you'll want to learn as much as you can first. Skillshare is an online learning community for creators, with more than 25,000 classes in graphic design, technology, and more. With Skillshare, you can learn all kinds of new skills, like how to use After Effects to make the kinds of custom animated graphics I put into every one of these videos. I've taken several Skillshare courses to improve my motion graphic design work. They're all very well done and easy to learn from. I'm forever a fan. Skillshare has teamed up with us to provide two free months of Skillshare Premium for the first 500 Design Doc fans that sign up with the referral link in the description below. Join more than 7 million creators learning with Skillshare. Sign up with the link in the description and learn something new. Thank you to Skillshare for supporting this episode of Design Doc.